Welcome to the Rebel Rebel Podcast. It's a podcast for creative rebels and entrepreneurs who want to know what other rebels are up to. The show was hosted by me, Michael Dargy, and we publish every week. I'd do it more if we could just get some more hours and days added to the calendar. I do keep trying. Thank you to our sponsors, The Friday Sock Company, for always making every day feel like a Friday and giving my feet a reason to party. They've got ethically made, purposefully mismatched socks, and I love them. You can have like bacon and eggs, uh, but they're not on one sock. It's bacon on one sock, eggs on the other, you know, but there's other stuff. Check them out at FridaySocks.com or follow them on social media at FridaySockCo. I'd also like to thank Make More Creative for the sound lab and the support, especially this episode for some reason. Uh, I had some glitches on my audio track. It would just sort of pop in and pop out. And, uh, you know, that's due to a fault in our EIE Pro interface. Uh, but we got it mostly under control. Uh, but if you do hear my voice turn into a bit of a robot, don't worry, it doesn't last long. Anyway, in this episode, I've got vocal powerhouse Doug Denant swinging by. And he talks about everything from being a live announcer at extreme sports events, like I'm talking monster trucks, motocross, all the cool stuff, MMA. Um, and we talk about how he got from his day-to-day -day job to his dream job of being a voice actor. And not just for sports, but commercials, television, film, and more. As you'll soon see when Doug speaks, it's an event. Now he even voiced this cool 30 second promo for Rebel Rebel set to a unique piece of music from our friend Emery Cords. Check it out. Rebels are everywhere. They're the people who say fuck it to the status quo. The ones who won't stay down no matter how many times they fall. Those rare humans out to change the world and share their story. Rebel Rebel a podcast celebrating creative rebels and entrepreneurs. This is Rebel Rebel. When he speaks, it's an event. I've got Doug DeNant sitting here in Kensington studio. How's it going, buddy? Good, good. It's a nice sunshiny day. I know. It's a nice change. <laughs> it is that. <laughs> it is that. Not so quite so cold either. Yeah. Uh, if you if you have been to a monster truck show or a motocross show, you or a UFC type show, you might have run into Doug and seen him announcing stuff. That's kind of your main stay, is that well? Right? It's the one that that's that's the most public, right? You know that that I mean nobody's I think terribly interested as as you don't post pictures of you sitting at the microphone here talking <laughs> to me. Um, when I'm sitting at the microphone, I'm talking to nobody. You right. know. That's a little weird. So yeah, voice so you actor and well, yeah. So you don't you don't see that that part of the business is the main part of my business, but you really don't see it. The fun part or, or the per memorable part, perhaps, yeah. is the is the live announcing stuff. And I've kind of specialized into. Uh, I guess you'd call them extreme sports. Yeah. Well, you got the voice for it. It's like Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it, years and years ago, I mean, back in the 80s, you know, they, they used to have that sound. Yeah. And, and nowadays, of course, it's not quite as as, uh, as much that, you know, monster truck guy. <laughs> but what's funny about that is when I produce commercials for monster truck shows, they're yeah. very local. Oh, right. Okay. So they run on local radio yeah. and, you know, local Internet shows and so on. And uh, I make them like the old 1980 spots with all the noise and the yelling and all that stuff because they cut through. Nobody would mistake them for a national commercial. And they're a lot more busy than a local one. Yeah. So it works out pretty good. Oh, that's neat. So, I mean, all right. So voice acting, uh, voiceover stuff, monster truck things. Did you just sort of stumble into this? You know, it's funny. Um, most people will want to know, you know, how did you ever fall into it? And, and back in the day, from a voice acting point of view, most of us came from radio, and so did I. I was a radio okay. announcer, and I worked midnight to six in Peace River, Alberta. <laughs> Um, and, and I would have made more money, I think, on unemployment than I did working wow. six days a week. But I loved it because I recognized early on as a, as a music guy, I never had the talent such as you do, or I, I don't have skills to perform in that way, but I could be a great fan. Uh. And I love to sit and talk about music. Yeah. And so so for me, it was a wonderful gig. It was a great yeah. job to do. And especially midnight to six, there was no rules. <laughs> so you could do some crazy things. So from radio is where most people think it comes from. And you yeah. know you have that sound as an announcer. But really, at the end of it, I'm an actor. I, I grew up as a, a kid, you know, doing acting in school mm. and being in, you know, operettas. And I could, 
you know, sort of sing back then and that sort of thing. And, and ended up being an actor when I, when my voice changed, you know, um, <laughs> did you I go from this? Yeah. Get, I had one, I had one <laughs> of these for a period of time. And, um, I, so I, obviously I couldn't sing, you know, in the same way that I was when I was younger, but I, I ended up being more the, you know, the sort of the heavy and that sort of thing in, in plays. Yeah. And then, you know, took drama in college as well as, as the other majors that I took and so on. And, and, and so for me at the end of the day, it really was an actor, which in a lot of ways really informs the monster truck stuff right. because it's a little, you know, surreal right. um, in the way that, that certainly I approach it. And that helped a lot from that point of view, but it also made me very adaptable as, as a, oh, as a voice yeah. actor where yeah. I could do the announcer thing, but I could also do the, you know, more real guy stuff and so on. Yeah. And I think that that's the foundation of it all, which is, you know, again, your background. Yeah. Actor, right? Well, so, I mean, your voice is, amazing right like i could just sit here and listen to you talk all day do you do you have to do things to make sure you don't wreck it you know for a long time i i, I could i guess like a rock singer you know I, I, because again my style is very over the top as yeah. a live announcer so it's a lo- it was a lot of screaming and yelling you know oh, you know this yeah. kind of stuff and never bothered me i never had a problem with it um, in the last maybe 15 years or so, I've noticed, I, I'd like to think it's the environment change, but I think it's just that I'm getting old, uh, you know, with the and, environment, man. And, yeah, <laughs> so I can't do, you know, or at least I couldn't do or, or feel as comfortable doing long gigs in a row. Oh, okay. So this past weekend, I had to work three monster truck shows, which are about three hours long oh. and two of them on one day. Oh my God. So I went to a singing coach, as you would go to an acting coach or whatever. And I went to a singing coach and said to him, you know, well, this is what I do. And yeah. first of all, he had to get over the idea that he'd never met anyone who does what I do. But, <laughs> but love him. He came to one of the shows and saw what I do. And then he says, well, replicate that, which is what I did. And he said, oh. you're on the floor running around with trucks and motorcycles. And when you talk to the audience, especially when you're getting excited, yeah. you tilt your head back. Oh. So tilt your body back. Right. And think of the basics of acting. You know, yeah. the, the basic stuff when we didn't have microphones on stages and you had to project to the back of the yeah. room. Yeah. You know, you had to use diaphragmatic breathing yeah. and you certainly didn't stretch your neck out. <laughs> so it was a very good point. And I found that, you know, even this past weekend, I have to be more careful, but I can still manage it. Right. And and that's an interesting point because it's about 40 years, 35 years of doing this stuff, like live motorcycle announcing and all that. And I always joked, you know, I'll be done when I'm 60. I'll retire when I'm 60. Well, I turned 60 last year and I'm not done. I still like it. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun, as that's you can awesome. imagine. right? Do you see the same guys on the circuit? Yes. So that's going to yes. be fun and, too. And it is. It's terrific. Uh, you know, this past weekend I saw guys I've worked with for... 20 years wow. you know um the promoter and i go back a long time uh i saw bill payne's group which is the straight up racing team you, you might know him as yeah. Rockstar, yeah, yeah and he uh he, he was there with all his guys and you oh, know wow. all that sort of stuff the motorcycle guys i just worked the fmx world tour stops with in canada and they were all hanging out, you yeah. know, Those and riding nuts. great. And, and so it was so much fun. to. It's kind of like a family reunion in a different yeah. arena, you know. Cool. So yeah, so it's a lot of fun. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I've w- watching the motorcycle guys and the tricks they're doing these days is nuts. Well, these kids were kids. They're, they're not kids anymore, actually. They were kids to me back in yeah. the day. But now they're all in their 30s. And I've known them for wow. 15 or 20 yeah. years. Uh, but they're still, you know, riding wonderfully. Yeah. And and the mix of them together was was a lot of fun. <laughs> but but again, you know, to see I, somebody once asked me to sum up, you know, what you do and and why you like it. And I thought, you know, is it motorsports? Is it you know the fight business? Is it voiceover? But the reality is is that I just like being around people that are really good at what they do yeah. and love it. Yeah. And and so. I couldn't possibly drive a truck or ride a motorcycle like these guys do, but they do it and they love it. And as a fan, coming back to the way I started in radio, I'm still just a fan of people who are good at what they do. Seeing you in improv is a good example of that. <laughs> and and so, you know, you look at that and you go, I can never be that guy, yeah. but boy, I sure like what he does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it makes it a lot of fun that way when you kind of fit into oh, the world cool. as a fan. Yeah, you know, and you enjoy going to work every day. I do, I do, and 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 the thing that I think happens for me, and I think that that 
has always worked for me. People have always asked, you know, well, how, how many times have you ever driven a monster truck? And so right. on. I've said, never driven one. I've climbed up inside them, but I've never moved it. I've never put it in gear and move it. And they, you know, well, why? Or have you ever ridden, you know, Keith Sayers freestyle <laughs> motocross bike? I, I could do it, but I never would. Yeah. And it, it, the reason why is, is that I'm really not the performer. I'm really the fan who just has a better seat. <laughs> and I always think that if I compromise that, if I ever yeah. become the guy on stage and not the guy who's, you know, in the front row going, yeah, oh. go, um, that I would lose the the thing that works for me, which I think is that crazy enthusiasm of that being joy. around people yeah. that are really good at what they do. You could never do it, but man, it's cool to be around it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It, now, I haven't seen a Monster Shark show since the... 80s yeah they're pretty much the same <laughs> and so do you or do they have stories still does like yeah Digger still have a thing where, yeah exactly each and... each each um promotion as it were you know kind of has their own guys and yeah. so on many times with uh, the promotions that i work with in canada we're bringing different guys together and we haven't mm-hmm. seen them for a while and they haven't necessarily run against each other um the last weekend or whatever like yeah. you might in a series type show but the thing that is important, I think, is that y- y- people want to see the trucks at first and they love to see the trucks and they yeah. like the notion of the, the technology, you know, how it's advanced and that yeah. it's 1,400 horsepower and this and that and so on. But really, I think people connect with people. Uh. And so to tell their stories, sometimes embellish those stories a little <laughs> bit, but tell those stories that way so that you can... The way I always measure it is is how much merchandise did we sell at at the middle of the show and was it specific wow. so in other words if we thought hey you know we've got a you know a a, a dragon dinosaur which we which yeah. we had this monster truck that looks like a dinosaur where the dragon blows smoke and so on and so forth how many t-shirts did we sell of that truck at intermission wow. and the reason why i always look at it like that is you start to spin the story then yeah you're telling the story and and many times that people will connect with a person may not be the number one truck or the biggest baddest truck, but they connect with a person wow. who drives the truck. How cool is that? Yeah, and same thing with motorcycles. You know what it looks like in motocross. They look like a bunch of Power Rangers running around, <laughs> right? You don't know who they are. You know they've got goggles on and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So again, you tell their story, and suddenly, you know, there's the kid who grew up on the farm, and then there's the guy who holds the world record in the backflip, and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah. And I think that that's what, as a fan. I think we can see the truck and we can see what they're doing. I don't need to call the action, as it were. Yeah. I think I need to tell the stories. And that's, that's awesome. really what I like to do because I love to hear those stories. So yeah. I share them with fans. Oh, that's cool. How So to that point, how much research do you have to do on the you know people that you're announcing? You know, I do a lot. Yeah. I do a lot because I'm interested in it, you know. So, so for example, I'm I'm interested in you know how how Bill Payne got his start, or yeah. what's he been doing lately, or where's he been lately, you know, yeah. as Argentina or whatever else it is. But but I think the the other thing that that I think happens is is to look at how the mix of them work, and you'll know what I'm talking about from an actor point of view of casting the right people in the right roles. Totally, yeah. Well, I don't get that opportunity. I don't get to cast them in those roles. Yeah. But I get to look at how do they fit together. So is there is there a young guy? Yeah. You know, is there the young oh, rookie? Okay. Is there the old veteran? Yeah. Is there the guy who maybe you know is is beyond his time and is going to come back and so on? And and all of those stories are the classic archetypes of theater or yeah. storytelling or anything else. I try to look to say, well, where do these guys fit and how do they mix? Yeah. And then the other side of it is is to know how how well they'll do. You know, in terms of uh, some guys are better riders or better drivers than other. Yeah. So you try to have a notion of where they'll kind of fit oh. in the hierarchy of things. So this is sort of improv as well as... Kind of. It's kind of like wrestling with improv, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, have you ever done a, a big wrestling show? I, I've announced wrestling in the past, yeah. it, but the live announce in wrestling is very much like live announce in boxing or in right, martial like arts. Martial you're, arts. You're following a script, you know, and my son does all of that yeah. stuff these oh, okay. days. I was, gonna, yeah. I was gonna say he sort of took the gauntlet when you. Well, I'm glad he did. Yeah, you know, I think the thing, and you you talked about it with the improv side of things, is that at first, as a, as a ring announcer or of that type of thing, you're, you're following, you know, kind of, you know, in this corner and right. the sponsor, he's this weight class, he's yeah. this height, this weight, and so on. It's a fairly stylized type of thing. Yeah. And Jay's done very well at that. He he actually follows kind of more of an old school code, even though he's a young guy, oh, which works well. 
well for him, yeah. you know. But the the thing that that he found was, and what always he shied away from the monster truck business or the motorcycle business is mechanics break, things go wrong. You're going to have to imp- improv, right. as it were, yeah. um, or, or improvise <laughs> or fill in or whatever else you call it. And he was always worried about that. And yet he does television for a lot of the boxing stuff, which is all, you know, yeah. ad lib and research. So he's <laughs> doing the same thing. It's just he's he's not usually in as much noise um, as right. I am and as much, you know, smoke and yeah. <laughs> dirt oh. and all that stuff. Is that where your gravelly voice comes from? No, probably not. No, it, it probably <laughs> comes from more from yelling yeah. for, for a, lo- a lot of times. But the reality is, I think that, that you know, the voice is, as you, as you know, from the, doing stage versus, yeah. say, film. You know, in stage, you're going to project a lot yeah, yeah. more. And, and yeah, and, and, and a lot of what I do and what I think, you know, people um, hear in the voice um, is, is the theatrics, you know, is the gesturing and jumping around and all of that sort of stuff. And as you well know, I mean, when you get excited, you know, you have a certain sound to it too. And then there's also a certain, especially old school style that has that rougher, you know, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday type stuff, right? Where you kind of just, you know, learn to do that. But most of the time, for me, I always think when I listen to myself recorded for television or whatever else it is when I'm doing those live shows, I always think he sounds like he's really excited. Yeah. Maybe he should try decaf, you know, because I do get pretty excited. But, you know, a, a lot of times the fans aren't kind of warmed up when they come in. And my job is to kind of make sure that they're pumped up for yeah. when things happen. Well, I mean, you're as much a part of the show as the trucks, right? I mean, everybody, you're the... I don't know. You're kind of like the personality that drives us all towards the edge. Well, yeah, yeah I like the way you say that. You <laughs> drive you towards the edge. Um, the, the, the you know, the the thing that that I think that happens and that I recognize, and this is again being a fan, not a performer, and so on, is they can do what they do without me, yeah. but I can't do what I do without them. Uh, fair so, so they always rank higher in in my mind. Yeah, you know, in the fair. sense of of you know, because because again, that when they are comfortable and doing what they do, then I can do what I do. Right. You know, which is be very excited because what's happening yeah. is exciting. Yeah. It's ridiculous fun. What's next for you? Like, it, it, it's just one show after another? Do you have like a big kind of... Well, you know, I, I'm, I I am slowing down a bit. You know, I might <laughs> only do maybe 20 or 25 weekends now compared to say 40 back in the day. Um, but, but the, and I work only in Canada. Oh, okay. You know, I, I'm not going overseas. I'm not going to the US. I'm only in Canada, only for Canadian promoters. Oh, and it, it not so much that it, it, it's just, it's much easier. I don't have a green card and to work in the United States uh, is not a good idea otherwise. Yeah. Um, from the point of view of live, as you well know. So being in Canada and trying to stay in the West, I I had really thought, well, maybe I'll be done with the live thing. But yeah. it's a lot of fun. It's friends meeting them in like the yeah. family reunion thing. So I, I plan to continue that for as long as they'll have me. And I always thought, oh, it would come to a time when I might retire and walk away. I think I'll just fade away. <laughs> I think over time, you know, that sooner or later somebody will go, let's stop hiring him. Let's go. <laughs> and and at that point, I probably won't replace the gig. Yeah. Interesting. So, so it's been, it's been great that way. And then the voiceover side of things, the one thing that, that live things or, you know, coming to see you or, or allows you to experience life. And, yeah. and I think that most people from the voiceover point of view, again, mistake the idea that it's a voice that matters. Everybody's got a unique voice yeah. and everybody's got a story to tell. The key is, is to try and have that unique perspective, that unique right. point of yeah, view. Yeah. And I find that by going out and experiencing life, whether it's with fans and monster truck things or traveling or whatever else it is, helps me to bring that point of view to voiceover. And I think that's a good thing. So I'm a little nervous not to be out in the public or out yeah. with, with people as much because you can get very isolated as a voice oh, actor. Yeah, because you've got your little booth. And, I mean, and I've seen your traveling booth. You know, exactly. I've seen pictures of that. And that's like, it's, it's you never know it from hearing the final result. I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah, but I just, I know how crazy it is just to stand there in front of a microphone it and is try things over and over and over again and you know it is hit it this way but but the most important thing i think and, and people will often and I, I use the same language you know where i was talking with a guy from france today and we were talking about the read well what he really means is the perspective Right. So when he says, well, you know, we'd like it to be kind and sincere, um, I'm not typically that guy, right? <laughs> I'm a more corporate announcer. I'm a more, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. But I can be that guy 
if I use acting skills. So right. I think of a place when I feel that way. Right. And strangely, most people would say, oh, do you think of your children? No, I think of my motorcycle. And you will relate to that. <laughs> yes, sir, I will. I will think of that and be very romantic about that motorcycle. <laughs> so that helps me to be kind and, and genuine, which is, you know, is an actor's technique as yeah. opposed to a voice technique. Well, it's fun when you don't notice the voice, if that makes any sense. Like if it's just, it's part of that story that's being that's told, right. that's unraveling, seems natural, it's in place. That's it, right. It doesn't jump out at you as a... That's right. Yeah. You know, if, if anybody comes up to me and says, oh, you were an awesome announcer at the show, I know I failed. Uh, I know I failed. You because if, if, yeah, they shouldn't yeah. notice me. I should be the glue and the grease that fits there. <laughs> and in a lot of ways, the same thing with, with voiceover is that, it's usually voice under these days, under pictures. Yeah. So it needs to be underplayed, in my opinion. Um, it, it, again, depending on the character. But generally speaking, yeah. the pictures are going to be very powerful. I mean, you just finished doing a film on your iPhone. Yeah. You know, the, it, It's amazing how many pictures now are used in things. And, and I think pictures and visuals are very powerful. And the voice should just be like the bass guitar, not the lead guitar. Uh, yeah, interesting point. Yeah, that's cool. The you mentioned the the sort of the video and the under stuff. There's a, I think there's a blend when like on stage in Loose Moose, for example, mm-hmm. if you notice the lights or notice the sound or notice the announcer, like the host or MC, then something's gone horribly awry. If you don't notice it, it's all part of this one package, then you know you've had an experience. That's right. And the same thing with I guess I'm just reiterating what you just said. Yeah, it, no, I, it's very true. Yeah. It's very true. But there are times. There are times when you have no choice. As an example, on Friday night, we had one of those nights, you know, five (laughs) trucks broke out of seven, you know, this type of thing where guys had blown up planetaries and taken out drivetrains and so on. And everybody's working on those things. Oh, my God. So there's no one to talk to is what I'm trying to get at. (laughs) And then you've got a situation where a kid who was racing motocross, a young rider, took a spill. Oh, and they needed to bring the paramedics out. Yeah. Well, you know, as you can imagine, wheeling a stretcher across dirt and so on and so forth, there's a bunch of time to fill. Yeah. And you don't know how long it's going to be. Ugh. So so again, you talk about preparation. There's a certain period of time where I will fill, but then my fear is always the last thing in the world anybody came to the show to see was the announcer talk. Right. So I go and find the one guy I've got set up. The uh, one guy who the, can be my go-to interview. And in this particular case, it was a fellow named Marvin Anderson, who was the five-time Canadian champion. He's been at it for 25 years, and I've known him that long. Yeah. So we could talk for half an hour about <laughs> stories. So I got to find him very well, as quickly as I could yeah. to help to fill in the time, because we don't know how long it's going to take. Right. And the other thing that I think is important is not to be... Um, you know, celebrating or being too showy when somebody's hurt. Totally. And having a conversation with a, you know, a very experienced driver where we could swap stories, to me is what you'd want to have in place like that because right. that would at least be something that would be interesting even though everybody realizes what's going on. Right. And, you I, know. and I mean, you're not calling so much attention to it that people are worried about it. Professionals are looking after it. That's right. It. The professionals handled. are looking after it. Yeah. And, and mostly it's, hey, well, let me give you some insights about, you know, Marvin and how he you know, threw his neck out, you know, <laughs> driving a steel body truck and had to retire in 2000 and then came back because of technology. Wow. See, aren't you interested? Wow, look at that. I want to know more. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Do you do any character work? I, I have um, in the past, uh, you know, animation type yeah. stuff and, and, and characters that are more in my wheelhouse. So, okay. for example, I never get cast as the good guy in, in animation. <laughs> I'm always the bad guy. Um, which is okay with me. They usually get better lines, yeah. as you know from yeah. theater. So much more fun. And then, yeah, and then, but I don't try to do a great deal of character work. Most of the time, when I'm cast as a character, I'm to sound similar to what I do now, oh, okay. and then bring the acting to it. You know, yeah. be angry, be mean, be you know, yeah. whatever it happened to be. And then you have to, as in animation, oftentimes you have to be able to at least have two other characters because you'll get up to three characters in a right. in a session. Yeah. And so a lot of times I will pitch the. Um, the character that I'm being cast for, like this. Yep. So he sounds like this, pretty much. <laughs> Just has a little, maybe a mean edge to him. Yeah. And then the other character is either lower or higher. You know, and, and that's the way it works for me. So I'm not a particularly great character guy. Yeah. But I get, I'm, I, I'm good at the ones in my wheelhouse. So the yeah. military guy, the, you know, gotcha. what we often call the bullshit announcer. You know, this guy, you know, that sort of stuff. And, and that kind of thing. But strangely, I have 
agents, of course, have sent me dozens of scripts for national commercials or various things for monster truck stuff, and I've never booked one of them. What? <laughs> I've never booked one what? as a monster truck announcer. The only ones I do is monster trucks are ones that I produce. Well, that's crazy. Isn't that funny, huh? Isn't that weird? It is what it is. Well, well, you know, it's funny. I went and I did an audition for this show called Detour, mm-hmm. uh, season three. Mm-hmm. And I was auditioning as the uh, part of the tattoo artist. Perfect. <laughs> right. And at that time, I had bald head. I had like the, the curly mustache yeah. with the goatee and stuff. And I was like, I've been tattooed a lot. So I'm, you know, fairly comfortable, you know, doing that thing. Did not get cast for it. Some guy that they ended up pasting tattoos on. Or something got That's cast funny. For it. It's funny, man. You, you just you never know when it comes to it, casting. It is. It's it like, is funny, and and yet I'm quite happy to be cast for the guy with a perspective. Sure. Uh, you know, in the sense that you know, it, again, I was I was talking about a, a financial organization today for these guys. Obviously, they're doing it in English throughout Europe. Yeah. But it was nice to have him back me off. Not be that oh, corporate narrator guy, you know, that loud sort of thing. And just yeah. be pr- pretty much like I sound now. Nice. You know, which is really just me. Yeah. And I think that probably makes the most sense from voiceover. And yet, as an actor, the hardest thing in the world to do <laughs> right. is just be you. I know. You know, it really is hard to do. So so I, it, it's an ongoing training for me. So yeah. when you think about what's next, you know, certainly the next gig will come along. I'm off to Los Angeles in a month, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. But but I think I think what, what really I look forward to is that, uh, you know, idea of working on the craft, yeah. of, of continuing to refine the craft, you know. And I think that 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 to me is is the is the goal because the financial side or, you know, the big gig side and so on, what I really try to do is is use a bit of a trick to myself, whether it's an audition or whatever the gig is, is that when I hear that that door shut to my booth, yeah, and I know this is the time when I need to give my very best in that performance. And while it may not be financially that way, it's the same principle I use when I when I do live announcing. They they often laugh because we use a a piece of music that we call a five minute warning song, which is kind of a pump up song. Yeah. Okay. And I will jump around backstage and dance around and do all this kind of thing because I, I want to make sure that, that I can bring that excitement yeah. to it and be ready, you know, to, to do that. Yeah. So the research and all of those things are all part of the contributing factor to that craft. Yeah. And the same thing I like to think about bringing as an actor or a voiceover talent is, is to continue to study that craft. Yeah. Cool. Have you ever seen the uh, behind the scenes footage of Jack Nicholson preparing for the shining? Yes. When he was like, just, he just went nuts. Yeah. Right. And there's a great piece of footage of, of Jack too, when he's doing that, you can't handle the truth. Right. Bit. And the director is asking him to do it over and over. And he's just doing that one little segment. Yeah. The thing that's interesting about it is it's always Jack Nicholson. Yeah. But it's Jack Nicholson with just a slight bit of difference. And yeah. most of it, I think, is what the attitude is he's taking right. in his head when he's saying the words. And that, that to me, is the secret to, to voiceover or anything, is, is that if you can be genuine with the words you're saying, yeah. you know, that, that that's really what people want to hear. They say act truthfully in imaginary circumstances. Yeah. Right? It's tough. It's a, it is. It's not it is. Thing. But I, I find that, that you know, again, when you think about voiceover, you know, standing in a little booth talking yeah. to myself is essentially what it looks like. <laughs> but what really what I try to be very clear about is, you know, who is that person? Right. You know, what do they think? Why am I saying these things? You know, yeah. what what's my reason for saying these things and if the words don't the words on the page don't give me that reason i need to find that reason yeah, is it hard to direct yourself very difficult yeah and and as i, I think the the key is and coming back to what you said you know um is, is the hardest thing to be is yourself is to to direct yourself to have your point of view be clear yeah not your fabulous read be clear right. because i will back in the day you know there was tape and razor blades and all that stuff now it's all digital right yeah. i can record all day long and i'm yeah. not going to run out of tape so the thing that that i try to do is is to is to do it a bunch of times and get that kind of reedy guy out of me uh, and then be really clear on my acting choice yeah good you know why am i saying these things and by then i've already got the words so i don't need to worry about the articulation of the right. words it's it's how i'm saying them or why i'm saying them and i think it's more important and that's the harder part to get to yeah when i was uh, i did some broadcasting stuff and one of the things i always drove me crazy was marking up your script <laughs> yeah do you still 
have to do that, or is that? I do. I do mark up the script. I I I, I use a technique in my own mind, that, you know, which I call Mike M I C, which stands for mechanics. Yeah. So I look to say, can I pronounce the words? Would always be a good one. Yeah. And then, am I pronouncing them in the right dialect? So, for example, the Southern United States is a little different than the Northern United States, oh, or Europe okay. is a little different than Canada in terms of the way that you're going to pronounce words or say words. Yeah. Resource versus resource things like that. Huh. So I'll do I'll do that work. Yeah. But it also then begins to get me into the script, right? Yeah. And then then the I is for intent, you know. What does the word say to me? What's the story? What what why why did they write it this way? Yeah. I wasn't at the meeting when they approved it, you know, right. what was going on there. And then the character, you know, what, why am I saying those words? And what if I can't feel that I can genuinely say those words, I don't maybe don't know what it is or whatever. I've got to very clearly think about where's a situation that I can put myself in yeah. where I would say something with that same emotional intent. So as you can imagine for me to do an audition or so on takes me a longer than, you know, ripping off a few reads yeah. to it. I try really hard to woodshed the script and yeah. do all that sort of stuff, use that technique and then be very clear on, on, am I really talking about what I really believe in or am I just saying the words to sound nice? Because you can hear that. I, well, like I a, like to think I can hear it once I get over the, you know, the, the way that you sound and all that sort of stuff. And I found that the biggest change for me is as we are sitting here, as we would if we were having coffee, if we weren't sitting across microphones, yeah. we don't have headphones on, that sort of thing. We're just talking. Yeah. And so I find that, you know, I need to have the headphones on for a certain period of time to maybe make sure the technical stuff is right or to yeah. get direction from you if, you're, if it's a directed session, but eventually get those headphones off. And, and just just talk. Yeah. And so I do a lot of lead-in lines where I'll talk about a lot oh, okay. of stuff and then edit all that stuff out yeah. afterwards. But but the reality is is, is that to me, um, I can be very overdramatic like you can on stage in, as a monster truck announcer. Yeah, you, but yeah. when the voiceover side of things comes, it's like film. Yeah. And you need to be, you can't fake it. Yeah. You know, the microphone can hear your hair growing. So, you know, you need to make sure that you're being very genuine. And that, I find, is the toughest challenge of all. That is the hardest part of the craft to do. Yeah. Huh. Do you protect your ears? I do. Now, um, I didn't when I was younger. Um, I stood around, you know, great big huge engines and so on and so forth to suffer hearing loss as a result. Oh, okay. Where hearing aids... Uh, implanted ones. Oh, really? Uh, but, you know, but I uh, I lost the top end of my hearing. Oh. So I, what I really noticed was uh, soft female voices. I can't hear the consonants. <laughs> so it's not a good in a party situation. Yeah. You said, what about a clown? Yeah. Oh, cold. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So I, I wear head, a headset now all the time. Oh, okay. Um, in the, in, and make sure that it's over my ears when the trucks are running. Kind of late. Yeah. But I think it's also important to show people because, again, all my pals and all that sort of stuff stood around those engines and didn't wear <laughs> headphones yeah, or plugged their ears. Yeah. Plugged their ears. <laughs> exactly. And I promote it to kids. Yeah. You know, we, we have uh, lots of head hearing protection options, headphones and or headsets and, and you know, earplugs and so on. And I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, you get one shot at hearing. Oh, and, yeah. and when that's when that starts to go... Um, yeah, technology makes some advances, but it's better not to have that problem in the yeah. first place. Do you wear foamies when you ride your bike? You know, I, I wear um, a full helmet, oh, okay. and then I, I wear uh, I use a Scala system to play music in, in oh, the, okay. inside the helmet. Um, again, I used to wear earbuds or you know that yeah. sort of thing, which is not particularly wise to do on a motorcycle. So I, my wife had bought a Scala system. A, 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 Bluetooth system yeah, nice. that I run in my head heads, so I don't wear the earplugs at all because I want to be able to hear the tunes. Yeah. Kind of like I got an easy rider soundtrack when I'm out there riding along. What's your favorite ride? You know, I, I like to go in the uh, the sort of secondary highways out to the northwest, yeah. and I like the ride out to Cochrane and then back across the back part of the north of the city. Yeah. But what I'm always looking for in those places is that stretch of freshly paved, right? Oh yeah. And uh, so, so I, I, I don't always find that, but I tend to wander around to kind of look for that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and that's, that's my, my favorite ride is one where there is no destination other than coming back home. Yeah, it's perfect. And what are you riding right now? I'm riding a Harley Street Bob and a great story with it. 
Um, it was owned by a freestyle motocross kid. No way. So, so I thought, you know, there's a great story. It's not just a Harley, but it's a Harley that was a freestyle motocross rider's wow. bike. And of course, that doesn't mean anything the way I ride it. <laughs> pretty conservative, pretty safe, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. But it, but it's a good story, and it was a great motorcycle to get from that guy. Yeah, no you kidding. Know? Yeah, so it was, it was a cool story, and, and I've enjoyed that bike ever since. Amazing. What's your favorite vacation destination? You know, I really don't vacation a whole lot oh, um, because, okay. again, I'm on the road a lot and I fly a lot and I'm in hotels a lot. So the uh, the thing for me is it's nice to stay home. Okay. So generally speaking, my favorite vacation spot is my backyard or my stereo. <laughs> um, but the, the in terms of the places I like to go, you know, Las Vegas is fun because there's always something to do. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I like going out east because I'm from Toronto. Yeah. Out east is in central Canada. So yeah. I like being out around Toronto in that area. I do some shows out there. And it's nice to go and hang out out there with some of those guys. A, yeah. a great story. About that, when I was a kid growing up, we watched shows called the thrill shows is what they were called, but they were the hell drivers. These are guys who would crash cars into each other and jump them through rings of yeah. fire and so on. And so when I was a kid, I watched a lot of this. And there was um, a pair of brothers who lived in London, Ontario, or just outside of London, Ontario, the Williams brothers, uh, Walter and Billy, and they were the hell drivers. Well, unbeknownst wow. to me... Um, I hadn't seen them for years and years and years. I did a monster truck show out in London, Ontario with a different promoter. And the promoter said, oh, I want you to meet these two gentlemen. And of course it was them. Oh my God. I was so nervous. <laughs> As you can imagine, <laughs> that, right? That like boy. they're heroes, yeah. right? So I told them the story that, you know, years ago, I, I'd had all the programs from when I was young and they'd signed them all and they got lost in a flood in a basement oh. and they ended up turning to mush and that was that. Yeah. Never thought another thing of it. And about three weeks later, Programs arrived. No way. I'm not kidding. Signed. Oh, I got yeah. chills. Yeah, it was pretty cool. The, man, those are some great guys. That's uh, so. Did you grow up in London? I grew up in Toronto. Oh, okay, like in Toronto. And they probably. were the they were the Trans Canada Hell Drivers yeah. in the sixties and so on. So. Far out, man. Um, that's cool. Uh, do you read? Do I read? Yeah, are you a big reader? Well, I read a lot because of, obviously I like, practice re- a lot research. reading out loud. Yeah. Um, and and what's interesting is um. I've often said, you know, um, jokingly, uh, but sometimes seriously, if I could just read, I could make it in this business because I have <laughs> dyslexia. Oh, shit. So, so for me to read a, a long script um, takes me a bunch of work, That's especially tough. with words that I don't recognize. Mm. I tend to look at words like like artistic symbols or Chinese lettering right. and as I- individual things on their own. And when I see a word that I don't recognize, it tends to throw me off. Yeah. So I, so I do practice a lot. And then I tend to read nonfiction. I read a lot of stuff about the music business. Oh, okay. Um, I've just read the book on uh, Altamont, um, read a book just recently on um, the guy who was the sound guy for the Grateful Dead, wow. you know, these kind of things. And, and I like to read that biography stuff, you know, yeah. that sort of thing, but mostly nonfiction. I tend to not read a lot of fiction. Your job is not the typical nine to five job. No, no, <laughs> definitely <laughs> not. People. It's funny because, and, and this perhaps sounds a bit arrogant, but uh, I remember a, a young uh, person, a number of young people coming up to me and they say, oh, how do you deal with the jitters of auditioning? You know, how do you deal with that sort of stuff? And I said, it's easy. You just have a year's worth of salary in the bank. Um, I, I was uh, fairly diligent in, in my day jobs, as it were, to make sure that I saved money and did oh, all okay. that sort of thing. So that when I launched the voiceover business and I went into that, I, I could do it with with financial backing like a business person. So yeah, in other smart. words, you know, you would never go and say, I'm going to just go and buy a Starbucks franchise right. and get started. Yeah. You know, you, well, gee, you probably have a few things you better think about, like staff and stock and yeah. leasing, yeah. you know, that advertising, all that sort of thing. So when I went into the, the business, I went into it knowing that I probably wouldn't make any money um, for a long time. But, but I, I had... I had wandered around being a voiceover person for such a long time. I was known, yeah. you know, so for example, I was the national voice of taco time back in the day. And, and the guy who hired me knew me from the advertising business, oh, wow. you know, that sort of thing. So when I went into the voiceover business, I went, well, you know, the world's your oyster. Now, this is quite a long time ago and the internet was, you know, hot and heavy and it was, wow, yeah. this is going to be great. Everybody's saying, Oh, you're make millions and millions of dollars. I said, you know, I've been in the business world for long enough to know that it usually doesn't work out like that. Yeah. You know, I'm not likely the next star that they've been waiting for. Right. And so so I've always approached it from that idea. And I think that that 
that's the hardest thing to do um, is, is is to find that place where you make that entry. Right. But it's kind of like, you know, whether you, you, one of the questions in the voiceover business is always, you know, should we join the union? Should I join the union? And I thought a great piece of advice was when it's the right time, yeah. when you need to join the union, then you join the union, yeah. you know, or, or when you need to do away with the job and maybe go part-time, then you, you do that. Right. But, but I think that there's that side of it. And then there's the side of it saying, but I can plan for that for a decade, yeah. you know, to make that happen as well. Right. And so I think that's really the, the luck that I got was that sort of thing to be able to have that business sense to go into this business. Yeah. And so that I'm not, you know, uh, the starving artist. Gotcha. I guess. Did, have you ever had a manager? I have. I have two managers right now. Oh, okay. um, I have two managers right now. I have one for radio imaging and one for my commercial work. Um, and then I have agents as yes. well. Except but the question. majority of the work that I get um, is is on my own. Is yeah. That is, is seeking out producers who could use somebody who sounds like me starting up a relationship with them. Yeah. You know, I remember one young guy who, who long story, but he's, he's now grown up grown old, sold the company and retired long before I did. Yeah. But when he was a young guy at a film school in San Francisco, you know, he, he said to me, well, why should I ever use anybody? You know, like, why should I use you? Yeah. And I said to him, I said, because nobody you know sounds like me. And of course he <laughs> laughed at that. Well, we did scratch tracks together. You know, you start working with yeah. a guy and I, I would do some of the scratch tracks, which are just laying down the voice yeah. when he was going to go and present his film projects. And so a long story short, obviously, he ended up selling those projects. I ended up doing the voiceover and, and away we went. Brilliant. But you can't do that if you're just auditioning. I can't offer that kind of service or be able yeah. to know. And another one with him, as it happens many times, is a challenging client, you know, and, and he's the producer. And so yeah. I said, get him on the phone with me. Let's get on the, the session yeah. together. And so this client was an interesting cat, no question. But again, I've been down the path before and I knew the guy kind of, you yeah. know, I had a bit of a relationship with him. So, you know, you felt like you would have each other's back and so yeah. on. So I still find that maybe that's a little old school to reach out individually to, you know, the people that I work with. But that's really the way that it works for me. That's awesome. You're, uh, if I could, um, so... People that are about to jump on this journey, whatever it happens to be. I mean, you gave the advice of planning in advance, having like a year's salary in the bank, mm -hmm. which is great. Uh, and I think fantastic. Certainly wish I thought about that. <laughs> well, and you know, again, I have a business background. The craft is right. the bigger challenge. You're yeah. a natural, right? And and it's it, it's harder harder work for me to be as good of a an actor or a performer as would, would come to you. I happen to have a business background, and that makes a bit of it, really? makes it work for me. So is that. It, for those uh, you know, rebels in waiting, is that kind of rebels in waiting? That's perfect. <laughs> the advice that I would give is use you know sort of the I call it the three C's for filtering decisions about what to do. Okay. You know, should I do that gig? Should I audition for that? Should yeah. I go out for that? Should I you know invest in my business or whatever? And I, I use three things. I use commerce for one. Yeah. Does it make sense? Is it economical? Yeah. Um, is the rate the right rate? You know, those types of things. I use credits. So sometimes I will do things like I did for your show, um, <laughs> where I wouldn't necessarily charge as much, but it's a cool thing to do. And yeah. it's, it's a great thing to do and support local, as we an example. We appreciate that. So well. credit for me or doing that for credit yeah. is, is an important point. And the third C is the most important for me, which is the craft. And that is continuing to study. I, I work with two private coaches. I attend probably four to five seminars a year. Wow. You know, for, for voiceover, that sort of thing, where I, I, I want to make sure that I'm always on the craft. So for me, a bigger filter a lot of times is, is it, is it the right thing to do for the craft for me? Right. So, you know, if it's that, that announcer guy, maybe I shouldn't do that. If it's right. more this guy, maybe I should do that. Those kind of things. Commerce is the other one. And then, and then as I say, credit. Yeah. So if you filter those things through, your decisions through those things, um, I think that helps a lot in terms of determining how you're putting together the whole plan right. of what does it look like. Yeah. Because many people go into this business saying, hey, I'm a natural. Right. And, and I, you know, the, the point of view I would take would be nobody's been waiting for you to show up. And there's already a guy who sounds like me. Right. So the, the idea being is, is that you got to bring that unique perspective to it. Absolutely. And I think that that, that takes time. It takes yeah. time for people to get that. Hence the commerce side yeah. of things. It takes some time for people to get that. 
Yeah, and I, I think you hit on something that's... I've, I think it's critically important is that it's your perspective, your story. It's your, I mean, you're the filter, right? So yeah, there's a guy <clears throat> who's got your voice. Sure. Like in that deep timber. That's right. There's a range. A million guys who have that voice. Uh, right. But there's only one guy who's got your experience that's going to add that color. That that's maybe, right. You know, is the most important part of this puzzle. That's exactly right. Yeah. You've said it exactly right. Is that, and if I can't be there from the script that's there, that's when the imaginary circumstances yeah. take place, where I imagine myself in a situation where I would have that emotional intent. Right. The words coming out of my mouth may have nothing to do with that scenario, but that's the most challenging thing of all. Yeah, absolutely. Doug, this has been a thrill. A thrill. A thrill. I bought the It's old... a thrill ride. <laughs> I yeah, bought here the we go. ticket, but I only used the edge. There you go. That's exactly <laughs> right, yeah. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your day and being on the show. Well, thanks so much for having me. And I love the idea that we have rebels in waiting yeah. listening. You know, be great because that's what you were meant to do. Hey, thanks for listening. And thanks again to our amazing sponsors, the Friday Saw Company and Make More Creative. Coming up next episode is photographer Jeremy Fokens to share his story of going from being a professional dancer to one of the most respected photographers around. Subscribe on Radio Public, iTunes, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Don't miss out. We'll see you next time.